It's getting to that point for Cabin 11. <laughs> yes, they need an upgrade. Please, where are the property brothers? <laughs> Come through. <laughs> Good. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Newest Olympian. My name is Mike Schubert. I'm a grown man that has never read the Percy Jackson series before, but on this podcast, we are slowly but surely changing that. I am joined again by Delia Gallegos, who is the CFO of Black Girls Create, as well as the co-host of The Nerds Are Typing. Delia, how's it going? It's been minutes since we last spoke. Oh, so much has changed in those few minutes, I gotta say. <laughs> We've refilled our water. We've powdered our noses. The world is a different place. The world is completely different. I now have fresh chapstick on. Ooh, I'm really important. a new person, but I'm doing great. Great. I'm glad you're well. I say we just get right back into chapter six. I become Supreme Lord of the bathroom and pick it up where we left off. So Percy just learned that the strawberry fields are used to cover the expenses of the camp. And Percy is walking around with Chiron. He checks in with Chiron to see if Grover is going to get into a bunch of trouble. And it's not looking good for Grover. Chiron points out that Grover lost track of Percy and that also Percy had to drag an unconscious Grover to Half-Blood Hill. So not the best showing. Chiron says that Mr. D and the Cloven Elders, which sound like very fancy satyrs, they make the judgment call here. And Percy says, well, they'll give him a second chance, right? And unfortunately, Chiron says that was Grover's second chance. Oops. <sighs> Chiron won't go into detail about what happened in the first chance, but I am sure that we will hear about this later. What's the classic playwriting idiom? Don't show the gun in Act 1 unless you plan to fire it in Act 3. Mm -hmm. I feel like at some point we are going to learn what happened on Grover's first task. But we shall see. So Kyron reveals that this first incident took place five years ago, and that prompts Percy to ask, how old is Grover? And Chiron says he's 28, and Percy thinks that's very strange, but Chiron assures him that it's normal because satyrs develop at half of the speed of humans, so really, he's 14, so just a little bit older than Percy. Can you imagine? I turned 28 in October, and I just, to have been on this earth for 28 years, and I'm still only <laughs> the mentality and life experience of a 14 year old that sounds exhausting to be honest yes i don't have a desire to do that i'm sure i will have a desire for this when i am old and my bones don't work anymore mm -hmm. but at least for now i am okay i also have just kind of been tricking myself i'm currently 29 but since the day i turned 29 I just keep saying I'm almost 30 so that when I turn 30, I'm just not going to blink. I'm just going to be like, yeah, I've been 30 for a year already. Now I feel young. This is fine. Exactly. And also, I like Grover. Chiron explains that he's a late bloomer even by satyr standards. I am a bit of a late bloomer in that regards in the puberty department. So I'm just super stoked for when I am 40-something years old and people think I'm in my 30s. I'm very much looking forward to that. So... I'm okay with my current aging structure, but yeah, being on the earth for 28 years and then still being 14, which is the worst age aside from 13, <laughs> would be rough. When I was 14, I didn't know it was, but that's why when I read this this time as an adult, I was like, oh my gosh, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, I was keenly aware at age 13 that this was the worst because seventh grade was horrible for me. It was mm. very bad. That was when kids started to be mean in schools and I... Didn't yes. like it. And I was acutely aware of how bad 13-year-olds were. Mm -hmm. Shout out to all the 13-year-olds listening. You're great. Uh, you're one of the good ones. So Chiron and Percy continue to walk. And Percy realizes that the forest is absolutely huge. And it's so thick that he imagines that no one has touched it since the Native Americans. Whoa, a non-crappy reference to the Native Americans. Would you look at that? A concept. Amazing. And it also makes sense for upstate New York. I've gone on a bunch of hikes upstate. I did a very great hike on the Mohonk Reserve. It was a very good time. It was gorgeous. It was beautiful. I like that this makes sense. I like that it was brought in. Shout out to Rick. So another thing that Chiron does in the conversation about Grover is refer to what happened to Miss Jackson as 
quote, your mother's dot 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 fate. So this gives Percy and me a glimmer of hope that she's not really dead. And Percy then brings up the underworld. And Chiron immediately knows what Percy is trying to get at with this. And he says, until we know more, you should just put this out of your mind. So I really am holding on to hope that Sally's going to be okay. But we shall see. Dot, dot, dot. Dot, dot, dot. So they then approach the woods. And Chiron mentions that the woods are stocked and Percy can test his luck, but he should be armed. And Percy, asking the exact same questions I did when I was reading, goes, stocked with what? Armed with what? <laughs> Which <laughs> I basically said out loud. You can't loud. just say these things. Right. You, you, th- these are intense words to describe a forest. So Chiron says that Percy will see, and he will see soon because Capture the Flag is on Friday night. So he asks Percy if he has his own sword and shield before realizing he definitely does not have his own sword and shield. He thinks that a size 5 will do for Percy, and he says that they will visit the armory later. And Percy thinks, what kind of camp has an armory where am I? What is this place? I think that we've all been through that and maybe not at a mythological camp, but you know, where you're just, you realize how weird the situation you're currently in is. And you're just like, what is happening? What is going on to me right now? <laughs> exactly. So they pass some of their elements of the camp, but the most notable is that there is an arena that houses non-lethal sword and spear fights, which certainly, without a doubt, there's going to be a showdown here. So they go to the mess hall. And the mess hall is just an outdoor, Greek-looking, roofless pavilion that overlooks the sea. And Percy asks, what do you do if it rains? And Karen goes, well, we still have to eat, don't we? And then the narrator, Percy, goes, I decided to drop the subject. Which is just perfectly awkward because Chiron's response here is so strange. That is such a weird thing to say in response. Do they just eat in the rain? Do they have some sort of spell that protects them from the rain? I love that Chiron gives this weird answer and then the narrator Percy just has the wherewithal to go, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna keep this conversation going. We're gonna stop this right here. I'm just gonna back away. (laughs) (laughs) So they finally get to the cabins. There are 12 cabins arranged in a U, but they all look very eclectic. Number nine has smokestacks like a factory. So my guess here was this must be the Hephaestus cabin. Number four has tomato vines on the walls and a roof made of glass. So my thought is this could either be the Dionysus one or maybe it's the Demeter cabin. And then number seven was made of solid gold, which I couldn't really think of anyone. So I guess maybe it's the Aphrodite one, but I feel like the Aphrodite one would just be pink. So I am not very confident in this, but these are my guesses. And I always want to let my guesses be put into stone here on the podcast so that I can look foolish or cool in the future if I'm wrong or right, respectively. Mm -hmm. So Percy says that all of these buildings face a commons in the middle with statues, fountains, flowers, and then, oh, I was not expecting this, but I was so happy. He also mentions that in the commons are basketball hoops, which Percy says, quote, were more my speed. And this is such an upgrade. And I'm trying not to compare this to Harry Potter too much. And I'm sure once we get into the story and out of world building mode, that'll happen. But in Harry Potter, basketball comes up. Basketball is my favorite sport. I love the way they dribble up and down the court. Harry mentions this to Oliver Wood when he's learning about Quidditch. And Oliver Wood says the two most depressing words I've ever seen written on a page. What's basketball? And to switch from what's basketball to basketball hoops, which were more my speed. Everyone who told me I would love this series was absolutely correct. I am so on board. Even if there's not a basketball scene in the books, I'm happy. But if there is mythological basketball that takes place, <laughs> let's go. Sign me up. Yeah, I again, I'm not very sportsy, but I do just like, if I had to choose world building that encompasses the world that the reader exists in, within urban fantasy, of course, versus one where the fantasy portion rejects the world that the reader exists in. I'm going to go with this one. Like, this is, it's much better. It's great. Basketball is a perfect sport. And I would hope that maybe, obviously this book was written in the mid-2000s, so there's no way Rick could have known. But currently, in 2021, one of the best players in the NBA is named Giannis Antetokounmpo. He's a very large Greek man. He's six foot eleven, got very long limbs. He's won the MVP twice. He just won the NBA championship with his team, the Milwaukee Bucks. 
if Rick could just write a short story about Greek god Giannis Antetokounmpo, that would just make my life. So I'm holding out hope, but I just love the basketballs in the mix. Ah, it makes me so happy. Let's put it out into the ether. You never know. Yes. Obviously, Rick is going to eventually listen to the show. Of course. We're going to become best friends. Hi, Rick. It's going to happen eventually. So I'm just going to keep airing out ideas for him. A proverbial alley-oop, if you will. Setting up the pass, let him slam dunk it because he's a great writer, and I'll be very happy. (laughs) But continuing on the cabin tour, cabins one and two look like his and hers mausoleums with walls carved with peacocks, and Percy correctly guesses that these are modeled after Zeus and Hera. When Percy notes that those cabins look empty, Chiron says that several of the cabins are and that no one stays in cabin one or two. And it's at this point that Percy puts together, ah, there are 12 cabins, there are 12 Olympians. This makes sense. There is one cabin for each Olympian. He stops in front of cabin three, and he starts to peek in, which Chiron says, I wouldn't do that. And it's ocean-themed, and it's empty. And for anyone listening, I've said it in almost every episode now, I am fully convinced that his dad is Poseidon. And earlier on, it felt like a cute little guess, but more and more, I think it's pretty clear that his dad is Poseidon. So... This only lends more to that belief of mine. Even where I've read to so far, it has not been confirmed yet, but I feel pretty sure about it. Interesting. We shall see. I was very excited when he went to the ocean cabin, and he looks in, it's empty, it makes him a little sad. Chiron then grabs him by the shoulder, and then they continue on. Cabin number five is bright red with a nasty paint job as if the color had been splashed on with buckets and fists. So my thought was, clearly this is the Aries cabin. But then it continues that the roof has barbed wire on it. So yeah, that is for sure the Aries cabin. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. Aries, God of War. Naturally, this is going to be the cabin. So inside, Percy notices a bunch of mean-looking kids. And the loudest one in particular is a 13 to 14-year-old girl. And narrator Percy says that she's wearing a size XXXL Camp Half-Blood t-shirt under a camouflage jacket. Here's my question. How did Percy know that her shirt size was triple (laughs) XL? Did he look at the tag? Is he that good at shirt sizes? Does he have a passion for merchandise? How does he know? (laughs) I was going to say a passion for fashion, but yes, also (laughs) merchandise. Like, does he have a future in fashion design? I have questions. Yeah. Has he already been making shirts on Custom Ink? And he's like, yeah, that's a Gildan triple XL. I know it when I see it. (laughs) He's got a whole screen printing business on the side. I just thought that was very funny that he knew exactly her shirt size, but not exactly her age. (laughs) This girl reminds him of a tougher Nancy Boba Fett. Percy then notes and brings up to Chiron that there's no centaurs here at the camp, and Chiron says that they are a barbaric folk, and you would only encounter them in the wilderness or at a sporting event, to which I thought, yeah, like a Dallas Mavericks game or an Indianapolis Colts game or a Denver Broncos game. (laughs) (laughs) And then I ran out of horse-themed sports teams that I could think of. See, I don't go to sports. I wouldn't have thought of that, but that is funny. I'm glad that you were here to make that joke. (laughs) Just doing my part. So Percy finally asks Chiron if he is the Chiron. And Chiron goes, oh, the trainer of Hercules and all that? And I thought, does the name Phil mean nothing to you? (laughs) Because I didn't know that Chiron was the trainer of Hercules. I thought this was just Phil because... As is made very clear, my Greek mythology knowledge is exclusively Hercules the movie and Hades the video game. We'll later, in between book seasons, do episodes with future guests of the show, Dr. Moya McTeer, who has a background in folklore and mythology, and she will answer all of the questions in a dedicated episode. I didn't know this about Chiron, and Chiron confirms that, yes, that's me, I'm the guy. Percy then asks, well, shouldn't you be dead? And Chiron points out that he can't die because the gods have granted his wish of being a teacher of heroes as long as humanity needs him. And he's still here, so clearly he is still needed, Mm -hmm. which is nice. But then Percy astutely points out what I was thinking. He says, quote, I thought about being a teacher for 3,000 years. It wouldn't have made my top 10 things to wish for list. (laughs) I gotta say, same. Especially specifically, like, teaching heroes, no offense, but, like, I don't jive with kids the way that teachers need to drive with kids. I can't imagine doing that 
forever. No, I can't either. The only teaching I've done, I did a student talk course in college about how to make YouTube videos because in college I was very into making YouTube videos. And my students were fantastic, but they were also my peers Mm -hmm. and they were 20-ish average age. I don't know what it would be like to teach kids that young. I've also done tutoring and I did an engineering thing where we would go to middle schools in Houston and teach kids about applying STEM stuff to real life. And that was very fun. But there is a difference between doing fun educational stuff versus the type of training that Chiron has to do for these people. And I'm sure that Percy will have to go through. But you're dealing with kids that, have powers of sorts and you have to teach them to defend themselves against giant monsters. It's a little bit different than me making bridges out of spaghetti and glue and teaching people that triangles are very strong shapes. It's a a very different set of parameters here for Chiron. And to do it forever is a lot, a whole heck of a lot. But I think it also tells us a lot about his character, which is also cool yeah so it's not my bag but i think that's cool that that is out of all the things you could have wished for that is what you wish for exactly that's noble yes not my cup of tea but enjoy yours Mm -hmm. so percy asks doesn't it ever get boring and Karen says no no horribly depressing at times but never boring and percy goes why depressing and then chiron does his now signature move of not answering a question that he doesn't want to and then quickly diverting to something else. And in this case, he goes, oh, look, Annabeth is waiting for us. So this is clearly Chiron's MO. This is what he does. And I think that this works better than what you'll see in some other series, which is either the person who would be in Percy's shoes here trying to explain the world to the reader, not asking questions or wondering to themselves, huh, I wonder about this when you just want to scream at the book. Well, then ask. Mm -hmm. So I think that Percy asking and not getting answers is much more believable Mm -hmm. than what we see in some other series. So I think this is fine. And I feel like Chiron and some of the other characters are taking a we'll cross that bridge when we get to it approach. And I think that that works very well and still from a world building perspective and a suspense building one of planting these little seeds. I have all these little seeds that I'm wondering what happened on Grover's first trip. Why is it depressing for Chiron? And all of those exist, but I am under the assumption that we will get to them later. And I think that that works better. I think it's also very age appropriate for a character of his age. Mm -hmm. Like kids, when you're younger... You ask sometimes impertinent questions because your curiosity is so... I was a very curious kid. I was famous for asking things maybe I shouldn't (laughs) be asking because I can't read the room. But asking the question and not getting an answer is definitely also a normal adult's way to deal with a kid who is not aware of exact... Like, you know what you're asking, but you don't know what you're asking. You know, like, Mm -hmm. why is it depressing? Seems like an easy answer, but you don't actually know what lies behind that answer. And I think that is very normal for a kid to overlook. And a great way to, like you said, plant the seeds, get you thinking. (laughs) I agree. I think it works for a 12-year-old. I was babysitting a couple months back. I don't know. He was younger. I want to say he was seven or eight. But it basically did just turn into me answering lots of questions about various things. And sometimes it got very deep and introspective. What we were doing is we were drawing our dream houses. And I was making a big game room and I was putting in pinball tables and stuff. And he asked me to explain pinball and I've never felt more boring and old. (laughs) Uh, It's this game with a slanted wooden base and there's a metal ball that you hit with flippers and it's encased in glass and you get points. (laughs) I sounded (laughs) so exceedingly boring. But yeah, I mean, it was a lot of questions were thrown my way by this young boy and it was fun to answer them. But yes, sometimes it got deeper than intended and you have to find ways to divert away. And I think Mm -hmm. Chiron does a good job here, especially because there's so much going on and there is so much to show Percy that Chiron is very effective at skirt skirting away from questions he doesn't want to answer. Mm -hmm. They see Annabeth. They say, let's go over there. Annabeth is reading a book. And when Percy tries to see the title, his dyslexia acts up. Narrator Percy says, quote, the letters looked Greek to me. 
I mean literally Greek. There were pictures of temples and statues and different kinds of columns, like those in an architecture book. So I love just flipping an idiom on its head and saying, no, 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 it actually looks like they are Greek letters. I am not being cute here. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Chiron says that he has master's archery class to teach, so he needs to leave, but he asks Annabeth if she can take Percy to cabin 11. So they go, and Percy notes that it looks just like a plain old cabin, but the door has a doctor symbol, so immediately I realize this is the Hermes cabin. And Percy then remembers that this doctor symbol is called a caduceus. At this point, I noted Percy is very good at remembering Greek mythology for someone who was failing Latin class. Mm -hmm. And we'll get a little bit of insight to this later. But uh, I started to pick up someone who's not doing well in this subject in school would not remember that it was called a caduceus. I didn't even know it was called that until I read this sentence. And then I had to Google pronunciation of caduceus to make sure I didn't screw it up. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely love Greek mythology. I took Latin like I was <gasps> that kid. Same. I took Latin in high school. And I, too, would not have remembered that it's called a caduceus. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. So there might be an explanation as to why Percy is so good at this. Perhaps there is. So Cabot 11 is absolutely loaded with campers. There's so many people in there that all of the beds are taken. There's people sleeping on the floor. I love this. Keep going. <laughs> it's great. So the kids start to size up Percy and Annabeth says, we'll go on in. And Percy recognizes, because he's moved school so much, that this is where he's got to make his first impression. And narrator Percy says, quote, so naturally I tripped coming in the door and made a total fool of myself. A plus. Love it. Of course. Classic. Naturally, this would happen. Mm -hmm. Someone in the room then asks, is he regular or undetermined? And Annabeth says undetermined, and they all groan, to which I thought, what? Hmm? What's going on? Then a cool 19-year-old, which I thought was impossible, with a five-beaded necklace and a scar going from his eye to his jaw, steps forward and says, now, now, this is what we're here for. Welcome, Percy. So he actually is a cool 19-year-old. Yay! <laughs> So we learn his name is Luke, and he's described to look like a Luke. He has sandy, short-cropped hair. He feels like a Luke, for sure. If you've known a Luke, he looks like that. <laughs> yes. Imagine a Luke. This is what Luke looks like. And then Percy looks at Annabeth, who appears to have the hots for Luke, which makes me a little sad as someone that is already shipping Annabeth and Percy. But the cool 19 year old, like what? Of course. <laughs> yes. He seems very cool. He is nice. He's got a scar and cool hair. It makes sense. I understand. Especially the scar. I mean, what? As a <laughs> former middle school girl who also crushed on cool older guys. Yeah, it's that was a wrap. I get it. <laughs> yes. I don't have any cool scars. I have a tiny scar on my finger where I got stitches. And then I have three burn marks on my arms that are all cooking related, all from different instances of trying to move a very hot pan or pot somewhere else to either stop setting off or not set off a smoke alarm. So clearly I have a type for my scars. <laughs> maybe not as cool as whatever the story behind Luke's is, which we'll learn, I'm sure, at some point maybe. Perhaps. But maybe I could appeal to people, but I don't have to anymore. I'm married. I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, and welcome to this episode's lightning brief. First, just wanted to let everyone know that if you are ever wondering what chapters we are going to cover in future episodes of The Newest Olympian so that you can prep beforehand, I will always be updating the schedule at thenewestolympian.com slash about. Also on our website, you can listen to all episodes of the podcast, you can learn more about it, and you can also go to thenewestolympian.com slash Patreon to support the show. I'm starting to post the first bit of bonus content there from bonus episodes to audio extras to my notes, etc. And speaking of that Patreon, I want to give a shout out to our next set of patrons. Again, I'm still working through the we had so many people support the show at once that I couldn't thank everyone in the first episode. And now I'm moving on to the gods tier. It's our $10 per month tier. And at this tier, you of course get access to our patron only discord where you can talk with other listeners of the show about what we've covered. Or if you already know future chapter stuff, you can talk about things and 
try to guess what I'm going to say about stuff. Or you can just talk about whatever with your internet friends. We have channels where people share pictures of their pets. We have channels where people share creative things that they're working on. It's a very fun time. You also get access to my notes. So the notes that I do in prep for the episodes, you get to see them in their full rambling caps locky glory. You also get access to sporadic director's commentary audio where I will talk about the production behind the show, what's to come, behind the scenes notes about how the recording went with particular guests, future guests, and a whole bunch more. And finally, you will get access to a sticker. I'm still working on what that design is going to be, but you will get a sticker. And in the envelope, I'll have a little signed thank you note in there as well. So again, if you want to check out this tier or any other tier, you can go to the newest Olympian.com slash Patreon. And we have more than 150 God tier patrons right now. So I'm just going to thank 50 of them right now. And for the next two episodes, I'll be doing another set of them. So shout out to Jessica Allen, Noel Basile, Hannah Elder, Rosie Dodds, Maddie Susie, Siobhan Ellsbury, Tiffany, Lola Mendeloff, Michaela Springer, Emily Reeves, Julie Gamble, Bobby Patel, John Kotker, Graylin Blank, Wendy, Nancy Delafena, Emma Livingston, Charlotte R., Gretty Hollister, Elizabeth Jomka, Aitan, Phil Green, Eileen Gazesh, Rose Beef Debris, Lisa Klutz Wayman, Aiden Parziani, Farzan Jarabat, Hagai Kiri, Michael David Yordi, Megan Brady, Rita Gomes, Evan Kleinschmidt, Tilde Johnson, Stephanie K., Georgie Duncan, Noel, Rees Diganen, Harsimran Singh, Suzanne Van Leeuwen, Jesse Fong, Shaked Ganat, Darcy Alexandra Harrison, Rach Nasira, Elise Chui, Ryland, James Salako, Catch Savage, Jordan Dunn, Leanne Kenny, and Emily Faris. And finally, before I go, just want to thank Multitude for having us as a part of the collective. Multitude makes a whole bunch of fun podcasts, and you probably would like some of them if you haven't listened to any of the other ones. And one of the ones you might enjoy is Join the Party. Join the Party is a collaborative storytelling and role-playing podcast powered by the rules of Dungeons & Dragons. In the first campaign, they explored fantasy, adventure, intrigue, magic, and drama. I had a couple cameos across season one, which was very fun. But in season two, in the new story, they are tackling science, superpowers, a better future, and the responsibility to help others. It's fun for the story, but also you can learn how to play D&D along the way. If you are not familiar with how the rules work, you are in luck. They have dedicated episodes where they teach you the mechanics and the structure of the game. So it's a fun time and also a learning experience. So you can listen wherever you get your podcasts. Just search Join the Party or go to jointhepartypod.com. And now you're going to hear words from a few sponsors who make it feasible for me to be a full-time podcaster. Some of these ads will be read by me. Others of them won't. The ones that are not read by me are inserted locally. So if you live internationally, don't be surprised if you hear an ad in your country's native language. So Percy catches Annabeth looking doe-eyed at Luke, and Annabeth then quickly hardens her face back when she notices that Percy has noticed this. And she tells Percy that Luke is his counselor for now. (gasps) She explains that Percy is undetermined, and the Cabin Eleven takes in all newcomers until they get figured out. So she says that for Cabin Eleven, their patron Hermes is the god of travelers, so he's all about this welcoming people in. I like this. I think this is very nice. It's clearly the Hufflepuff of the cabins here. I love it so much more because, you know, in Harry Potter, it's like, and we'll take all the rest. Like, it's the discards or whatever, which that's a subject well spoken on. Like, you know, a lot of people have a lot of issues with sorting. And I just love, in general, the concept of the different cabins and the different personalities that kind of belong to each cabin, which, of course, you'll learn as you keep going. But I love the idea that it's very purposeful that Cabin 11 has all the rest. Like, there is logic and lore behind it rather than just like, I don't know, this is just where we stick the people who don't have another place. Like, there is a reason for it that belongs to the Greek mythology lore. Right. It goes beyond just, oh, this founder is nice and the other three are all hyper-specific in the people that they want. But instead, you have an actual Greek mythological explanation, which I think is cool. I'm also a big fan of Hermes because Hermes's representation in Hercules and Hades is good in both. So I am a fan. <laughs> so Percy sees the spot on the floor that has been left for him, but he doesn't have anything to really mark that this is his spot aside from the horn. But he doesn't put the horn down because he remembers that Hermes is also the god of thieves. Again, Percy, very good at Mythology for someone who was failing Latin class. Mm -hmm. Annabeth then takes Percy outside after an embarrassing conversation where Percy keeps asking how long figuring out what cabin he's in will take. And she's frustrated at Percy and mutters, I can't believe I thought you were the one. And at this point, I'm thinking, oh, your classic chosen one trope. Is he Neo? Is he Harry Potter? What's going on here? What's the deal? Very intrigued. This book is very good at planting little seeds and keeping me on the edge of my seat. I never want to stop reading it. (laughs) Percy then gets angry 
because he says, I kill, quote, some bull guy, and then this all gets thrust upon me? And Annabeth notes that the other kids here would have loved that chance. And Percy says, well, if I really did kill the Minotaur, that doesn't make any sense because there should be only one. And didn't it die way back a bajillion years ago in the labyrinth at the hands of Theseus? Annabeth explains that much like in Hades the video game, so a concept I'm familiar with, monsters can't die because they don't have souls. So you can dispel them for a while, but eventually they return. So Percy starts to ask about his experience with Mrs. Dodds, his math teacher that he vaporized in the Met. And Annabeth starts to say, oh, yeah, the fear, uh, your math teacher, which not a great save from Annabeth here. But Percy asks, how did you know about that? And Annabeth says that he also talks in his sleep. So she is just picking up on his drooling habits, his talking habits. She has read Percy like a book. And I'm very much here for it. I think it's good with anybody you're crushing on just to get these like flaws out of the way because you don't have to worry about them later on, you know? So it's better for Percy. He may be embarrassed now, but in the long run, like you can just relax into an easy friendship a lot easier if you already got this embarrassing stuff out of the way. (laughs) Totally. Then you don't have to worry. uh Oh, what if she finds this out? Well, now she already knows it's already out there, though. I did have the opposite effect of that when I was first in the wooing faces with my now wife, Kelly, after we had made it clear to each other, our feelings for each other, the very next day we were walking around and I was a stumbling, bumbling mess. And I guess it was the reverse where before I was very on top of, oh man, I really got to look cool. And (laughs) like, I got to be on top of my game so that she likes me. And then when I learned that she did, I guess my body just let all the carefreeness (laughs) go and I tripped up and down stairs. I was a mess. <laughs> Amazing. And look, it worked out. Instead of being like, oh, wait, so was this all bundled up the whole time? I think I'm good. <laughs> I mean, she stuck it out. That's lovely. Power to her for sticking it out with me because she easily could have been like, oh, can I just take back the part where I said I like this guy? Because he's a dweeb. <laughs> so Percy caught the thing where she almost said fury. She did get 75% of the way through the word, so I would hope that he caught this, but he did. And he mentions, aren't these Hades torturers? He knows so much. At this point, I'm just screaming at my book. How does he know so much? Annabeth very soon explains. So Annabeth says again, don't mention them by name. You have to call them the kindly ones if you must refer to them. And Percy has a great thought, which I agree with. He says, look, is there anything that we can say without it thundering? Which is great. His exasperation always comes at the points when I get exasperated. Mm -hmm. So I really feel a kinship to Percy. I think it's so well done. And Percy goes on to make the astute point that why does he and everyone else have to sleep on the floor of cabin 11? There's loads of extra beds throughout the camp, which I agree with. But even that, they're Greek gods. Can't they just magically make cabin 11 bigger? Right? Is that so hard? Yeah, they apparently don't have like extending charms in a this world building. <laughs> I mean, at the very least, the Hephaestus cabin is a fully functioning factory. So can't they just make more beds or make quadruple bunks or something? Or, you know, like have a inter cabin, like who are the builders? Like, can we get you to build an extension and we'll do this and ex- like, you know, an exchange program of some sorts? Yeah, just like a lot of families do after their kids go off to college, they get bored. So they renovate their home. And that's what you do. You add an extension. And I feel like this is a thing because my parents are doing this, mm-hmm. but it's also kind of a, they're working from home thing. So they're adding a home office thing. But Kelly's Parents recently redid their master bathroom. I know people who turn porches into dens. I guess this is just like the classic thing you do when you turn 60 years old is you decide, we got to change up the house. We've been here for too long. Got to make it feel fresh and new. And I think it's it's getting to that point for Cabin 11. <laughs> yes, they need an upgrade. Please, where are the property brothers? <laughs> Come through. <laughs> just imagine them showing up to Camp Half-Blood. <laughs> Hey, what's up? I'm the business one. (laughs) Hey, it's me, the hotter, rugged one. I'm going to build out the house. But like they can't explain that it's a mythological camp. So they're just like, these are interesting cabins you have here. Interesting cabins. So rustic. Let's make a new extension. (laughs) So Annabeth continues and says, you can't pick a cabin. It depends on your parents or your parent. And Percy says, my mom is Sally Jackson. She works at the candy store in Grand Central. At least she used to, which, uh, crushing. 
I hope she's okay. In case you forgot, we are also grieving. Just <sighs> Gosh. But as we talked about in the last episode, I think it is good to constantly remind us that Percy is and should be and is super normal for this to be his emotions. He's sad about his mother very recently, quote unquote, dying, question mark, dot, dot, dot. So Annabeth says she meant his dad, and Percy says that his dad is dead and he never knew him. And Annabeth sighs, and narrator Percy describes this as, quote, clearly she'd had this conversation before with other kids. Annabeth says, your father isn't dead, Percy. And I screamed at my book, yeah, because he's Poseidon, <laughs> god of the sea. <laughs> Percy asks, do you know my father? And she says, I know you. And Percy says, you don't know anything about me. And then she just starts spitting everything about Percy. She says, you probably bounced schools a lot after getting kicked out. You were probably diagnosed with dyslexia and maybe ADHD. And she says, when you try to read, letters fly off the page, right? Well, that's because your brain is wired for Greek. And this is where I said, ah, this is why he is just inherently good at remembering Greek stuff. And then further explanation, she says, your impulses, your ADHD, is your battlefield reflexes. It would keep you alive in some sort of duel or fight. And then she goes on to say, of course the teachers want you medicated. Most of them are monsters, and they don't want you to be aware of what's going on. So that could also explain why he's good at Greek stuff, because now he's away from them, he's in the Greek place, he's getting better at remembering things. But also, I'm very intrigued by the monster's medication thing. I don't know if every teacher is a monster. I don't know if this is a critique on monsters. I don't know if this is a critique on medication. I don't know if this is a pro-medication thing. I didn't really know how to feel about it. I did just feel very shocked. It was a lot at once. So rereading this, I thought it was interesting because I said in the last episode how I read these in middle school multiple times, like it was kind of a fever in my school in general. But at that time, I wasn't diagnosed with ADHD. I didn't get diagnosed till late high school and, you know, gone through the journey with that. And I didn't remember and I still want to reread them just, you know, to like see how the representation hits differently because I have remembered it since being diagnosed and thought like, these are just battlefield reflexes, you know, just like as a funny aside to myself. Mm -hmm. But I also did not remember this like potential narrative of like being pro or anti-medication. And it's interesting. I don't know if you've talked about this at all, but part of the reason why he wrote Percy with and these characters in general with ADHD was because his son was diagnosed with ADHD and he wanted, you know, that representation for his kid. And so it makes me wonder, I'm like, was he pro or anti-medication for his kid? I don't know. It's very odd. And I don't know how I feel about it either. But interesting that it's there. Yeah, it's something that I would want to see how it develops in the story if we get into this more or see what Rick has said about it. And also... Just like in between books, I want to do episodes about the mythology. I also want to do episodes about the mental health aspects of it, because I think that those are important conversations to have. And I think it is interesting to see how it plays out in these books and how those conversations could take shape if you are reading these books to someone that's younger in your life and how you could have those conversations with a younger reader or even just as an adult reader because yeah you and I don't really know how to feel about this I don't know exactly what they're getting at with this mm -hmm. I am not well versed in this but my understanding is that medication is a good thing to do to address mental health but also it's different for everyone mm -hmm. so maybe it's a gray area type thing but it did feel like upon my first reading that Annabeth was coming in as anti-medication and I didn't feel like that was great. Yeah. If you find anything and like share it about if you found if Rick has said anything about because it really seems to reflect maybe his own experiences, which is fine. Like, again, like you said, everybody's experience is different. Like I've been on both sides of personally being pro or anti-medication for myself. Mm -hmm. But I do think it's weird to put in a story where a lot of kids are reading it because I think in general – medication is a useful tool. So if you have ADHD out there and you're on medication, like that's the right choice for you. That's great. It's an interesting narrative. And I'm also curious to see how it plays out in now my adult understanding and also my own personal experiences. Yeah. And this is also what's fun about making these kind of podcasts is that the community can help educate me on a lot of different things. And I would love to hear from folks if you have medication and or did in the past or what was good, what was bad, et cetera, whether you reach out on social media or you're on the Patreon Discord or shoot me an email, I think it would be very nice to learn more and just further 
the discussion around that. And then, yeah, we'll do an episode solely dedicated to it when we're uh, in between books, which will be nice. So Percy says, it sounds like Annabeth went through the exact same experiences that he did. And she says, yes, and most kids here did. She also lets Percy know that if he wasn't like the rest of the campers here, there's no way he could have beaten the Minotaur. And he also couldn't have survived the Ambrosia and Nectar. And specifically referring to them as Ambrosia and Nectar makes me very happy because in Hades, the video game, the two things that you use similar to this are legitimately called Nectar and Ambrosia. And both I and Percy go, huh? Because Mm -hmm. in my brain, Nectar and Ambrosia are just good things that are nice and are fancy and part of Greek mythology. But to hear that you couldn't survive it was confusing. But Annabeth clarifies. She says, quote, that stuff would have killed a normal kid. It would have turned your blood to fire and your bones to sand and you'd be dead. Face it, you're a half-blood. What the? F- what? Is- huh? <laughs> Why? That's a lot. That is a whole heck of a lot. And the thing is, they know this, which yes. means there's experiences there. And that's, wow. Okay. Good to know. For the rest of us, not half-blood, unfortunately. Yes. The other thing is because it is Greek mythology and magic and powers, I don't think that she is using a metaphor here by saying that your blood will turn to fire and your bones will turn to sand. I'm taking this literally that your blood is flames and your bones is tiny particles that make up sand. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I also don't think this is exaggeration, metaphor, none of that. It is quite literally your blood is now fire. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, Percy doesn't get any time to process this because, uh uh-oh, here comes the big girl, who we learn is named Clarice, and she is looking to give Percy an initiation, which is never good when said angrily. It's very fun if Luke said it, because then it's going to be the classic thing where there's a blindfold over your eyes, and there's gummy worms, and we pretend that it's something gross. But when she says it... It's not great, and what it becomes is something that I should have seen coming, because of course that's what the initiation is. Now, Annabeth says, and I will butcher this pronunciation because I am 0% Greek, she says, Ere es Caracas, which Percy somehow understands is Greek for go to the crows, but he puts into perspective as the narrator says, quote, though I had a feeling it was a worse curse than it sounded, (laughs) (laughs) which is very good. It reminds me of when I learn about idioms in other languages. There's a stand-up comedian that I knew who would talk about idioms from around the world and then just translate them to English. And they all sound absolutely ridiculous, but it's one of those things where I think just sometimes language doesn't translate and either an idiom will sound strange or something that's supposed to be intimidating will sound completely harmless. And I think that's the instance here. If any Greek listeners know what this actually kind of translates to, if this is actually a real thing, hit me up. Let me know. Mm -hmm. I would also like to see that. Annabeth says you don't stand a chance to Clarice. And Annabeth reveals to Percy that Clarice is a daughter of Ares, which makes sense because she was in the Ares cabin with the barbed wire and the fist painting, not even finger painting, punch painting. And Percy, in response to this, says, like the war god? And Clarice sneers. And she asks, you got a problem with that? And Percy says, no. And then he continues. And this is the first instance of a common thread of Percy, which I appreciate. It's why I loved Spider-Man as a superhero. I do this when I play basketball. He can't just say something. He has to say something and then also take a dig at his adversary. So he doesn't just say no. He says no, and the narrator Percy says he was recovering his wits, like he has to come back to be who he truly is, which is snarky boy Percy Jackson. And he says, quote, it explains the bad smell. Get him, Percy! Yeah! (laughs) (laughs) Me, who is, like, very conflict avoidant, I love this for Percy, but I'm like, I would never. I would, I'd be like, yes, ma'am, I, just trying to mind my business, get through this camp. (laughs) What I like for Percy is that it almost feels involuntary. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I relate to because I like to pride myself on being a nice human being in regular life. But when I play sports, I am so mean. Not to the point where I do unnecessarily rough things and try to injure people and stuff, but my mouth runs way too much and too far. And I do it to try to get in the heads of my opponent and get their heads out of the game going against the mantra that Troy Bolton has all taught us. 
and it works. But sometimes it's just I don't even get a second to think about it. And then immediately two seconds later, I think, well, I I didn't need to say that. That was unnecessary. (laughs) So I like that for Percy, it just feels like a reflex where he just shoots a snarky comment towards people when threatened. And I feel a kinship here and I appreciate it. And he's also good at it. Like Rick is writing very good 12-year-old snarky jokes. It's good. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the Harry Potter fandom likes to talk about, you know, sassy Harry when he has these sassy moments. But like, that's just Percy's state of being all the time. And I, as a reader, absolutely appreciate it. And what you're talking about with athletes, my husband played tennis like all through college and all that, Mm -hmm. whatever that's called. Sports. (laughs) (laughs) Sports, you know, um, because I don't understand. It's so funny because he's so nice. But when he talks about playing tennis and like the things he would say and do to get into his opponent's head, specifically just for that reason, I'm like, you? Really? Uh, okay. (laughs) Tennis has a lot of them. You can do little tiny things in tennis, especially when you're playing against someone and you don't have a line judge that is calling in and out and stuff. Mm -hmm. You can do little things like when your opponent hits one that is very clearly out, you still say out just to anger them like, of course it's out. It hit the fence. Like you can do little things like that. There's a lot of things you can do in tennis. (laughs) And I did all of them. I think it also, I don't think it ever is like directly addressed, but I would say, you know, knowing that he has is diagnosed with ADHD. That's also true for people with ADHD. Like the impulsivity part sometimes makes us not think before we speak. Like we just say things without thinking about them. Not, and and again, you know, like everybody's different, Mm -hmm. but that would be true to that diagnosis. And I think that's also interesting. Definitely before being diagnosed with ADHD, I didn't pick up on and it can get you into trouble. And that's a thing that, especially for younger people who are being diagnosed that like doctors look out for is impulsivity problems because sometimes people think about that as like decision-making issues, but it can also be just like interrupting all the time, blurting out thoughts, not thinking through like having social issues because of that, which telling people they smell. eh. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But another thing and specifically getting to the fact that he told her that she smells I think what works more about Percy's insults as opposed to Sassy Harry, because I loved Sassy Harry. He was very good. And a lot of the characters in Harry Potter have very sassy remarks. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you could tell it was just J.K. Rowling being a snarky adult writing snarky dialogue for these kids. And when you take a step out of it, you think, oh, 14-year-old would not say something this eloquent. I like that Percy's insults so far are just, you smell. (laughs) And some of them don't land. Some of them sound really kiddish, which I think is fun. Not every insult from a 12-year-old is going to be great. Not everything's going to be a perfect zinger. And I appreciate that these feel like something that a threatened 12-year-old trying to talk down a bully would say. And it feels believable. And I appreciate that. So Rick is hip with the youths at least in the mid-2000s. Which makes sense because he was an English teacher, so it makes sense that he is very much more familiar with the lingo Mm -hmm. and the vernacular of actual 12-year-olds versus how, no offense to a lot of great authors, but, you know, how they write, they think 12-year-olds talk. Yeah, I think for mid-2000s was probably correct. There was a well-duh in there somewhere where one of the Greek people asks, what do the kids say these days, Mm well-duh? And then they have to confirm yes, and then they say, well-duh. But mid-2000s, maybe. Mm -hmm. That could be pretty common. I could see it. So Percy says it explains the bad smell. Annabeth just kind of stays out of it, which is exactly what Percy wants. He recognizes that he's the new kid and he's got to earn his rep on his own. Percy then hands Annabeth the horn in a hold my beer moment, which is (laughs) incredible. And then before he can even realize it, Clarice has him by the neck and is dragging him towards the bathroom. And immediately I recognized, oh, no, the initiation is a swirly, Mm -hmm. of course. But then I remembered that the chapter title was I Become Supreme Lord of the Bathroom. And then I felt immediately at ease knowing Percy's going to be okay. He's going to be fine. So Percy, as he's getting dragged to the bathroom, and I appreciate narrator Percy so much, he just dunks on the bathroom for not being that nice and generally smelling pretty terribly. And he says, quote, if this place belonged to the gods, they should have been able to afford classier Johns, which is impeccable (laughs) and true. Why don't they have really nice bathrooms? They have magic. That doesn't make any sense. Maybe because do great gods use the restroom? Maybe it's not a priority for them. I don't know. But I think Percy is really on the money here. 
Clarice then scoffs at the notion of Percy being, quote, big three material, which I know is not referring to what happens in the NBA and the WNBA and other sports with small teams where you get three really good players and you say, we have a big three now. I recognize this is probably referring to cabins one through three, but we'll see. So Clarice pushes Percy's head closer and closer to the toilet water. But then he gets a feeling in the pit of his stomach, which I think is the same feeling that he got back at the Met when he accidentally, quote unquote, put Nancy Boba Fett into the fountain. And then the plumbing starts to rumble and water shoots out of the toilet. And at first it arcs over Percy's head to hit Clarice and she kind of stumbles back a little bit. And then he moves out of the way and it shoots at her like a fire hose. And her friends come in to try and help, and six streams of water all shoot out at all of them. And then the showers start acting up too, and they shoot the reinforcements, and basically everyone is getting absolutely soaked. The bathroom is flooded, Annabeth even gets wet, but she is far enough away where she is not being knocked away. These other people are getting knocked off of their feet by the powerful stream of water. And when the dust or the water settles... Percy realizes that the only dry spot in the entire bathroom is surrounding him. And that is very cool. And also hard because water naturally will just fill whatever space. So the fact that he has a dry circle around him is impressive. Iconic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Clearly his dad is Poseidon. How else would he be able to control the water? Come on. So Annabeth asks, how did you do that? And Percy says, I don't know. And (laughs) Clarice then gets up. She is drenched, she is smelling of sewage, and she threatens PJ that he's dead. Classic bully thing. You're dead meat. And Percy then says, as the narrator, I probably should have let it go, but I said, you want to gargle with toilet water again, Clarice? Close your mouth. This is an example of not landing. That was not a good one. (laughs) Not your best work, Percy Jackson. (laughs) No. No. But regardless of not necessarily being the coolest burn, Clarice is very angered by this, tries to lash out back at Percy, but all of her friends put her in the classic hold me back situation and they carry her off kicking back to their cabin. Annabeth is just staring at Percy and he asks, what are you thinking? And she says, I'm thinking that I want you on my team for capture the flag, which is great and a very fun way to end this chapter and also this episode of The Newest Olympian. So good. I love, love, love that scene. I also just love the detail of it's not just water. Like, Mm -hmm. it smells like sewage. Like, could have left that out. Just wanted to highlight that, like, oh, no. These bullies were definitely handled. Mm -hmm. There are some gross things that took place for these bullies, but they had it coming because they were being very rude. But Delia, as far as these two chapters that we've discussed over these two episodes, what are your thoughts about the opening of the book and the series? Any general thoughts before we conclude? Well, firstly, I think it holds up. Yeah. Not to say you're not, I can think of things that you will run into, you know, oh, it was a different time, even though it wasn't that long ago, you know, Mm -hmm. things that may not hold up. But like when you compare it to something like Harry Potter or... Like, I don't know if you read a series of unfortunate events. I'm trying to think of other series from around that time. Any Disney Channel original movie that came out in the mid 2000s. <laughs> right. That don't hold up. I feel like as far as like how they age, like this has held up really, really well. And that just it makes sense when you see what Rick Riordan has done since then with his series and his world building and things like that. And I just, yeah, I love it. It's as happy of a series as I remember. And I think, yeah, I think you're going to have a great time. That's it. I think I am too. I have loved what I've read so far. I have an ear to ear smile when I read the books. It pains me to have to stop for the purposes of the podcast to not read ahead because me trying to guess is a very fun thing. But it's great. And I have so few negative notes and I'm very excited. With Potterless, I started off a little snarky and then I grew to love the series. Right now, I'm already on board. What you said is right. It's just so happy and fun. And I'm very appreciative that this book series exists. And I'm very appreciative that the Disney Plus show will come out in 2022 or 2023. I don't know if it has an official release date yet. And I hope that that does for this book series what the Harry Potter movies did for those books, what the Hunger Games movies did for the Hunger Games books. I think that 
the Percy Jackson series, my understanding is that it doesn't have the acclaim it deserves because the movies were just so bad and you couldn't hit that wide audience. And hopefully the Disney Plus show will change that because this is just so good. The theming that I've done around the show before I started it was, is Percy Jackson the YA series we should have been reading all along? Have we as a society collectively been sleeping on Percy Jackson? And I think we are. Absolutely. I get that I and people my age have the excuse of we were just a little bit too old for this. Mm-hmm. But I feel like this book series is so good. I don't understand how it isn't on that Harry Potter level. And I think it is just because the movies were bad. I think it's because the movies are bad. I think we just aged out of the right or depending how you look at it, wrong time. Because like I said, I never read the last book because I think the last book came out when I had started high school. So at that point, I was like, I'll get around to it eventually and just never did. I've heard that with a lot of people who I either have had or am having on the show is that they stopped reading and it's always the last book just because they got too old. And I think that's just a timeline thing where maybe people who are a couple years younger read the whole thing and such. But man, these books are so good. (laughs) And it's so happy. I also want to, because we talked about how happy they are and they're so good, but also while still dealing with very serious things, like we talked about earlier, the grief of it all, the mental health of it all. And it's just done so well. And again, for listeners who have already read (laughs) the books, I'm not saying that there aren't parts Of course, you know, they are of their time and there is no perfect series, but they, again, they just hold up. I think you're going to have a great time. And I think it's just the nuance they handle certain subjects. I think it's just, yeah. And I'm super excited for a certain plot twist that you're going to get to enjoy. I am very excited. You're going to have a great time. (laughs) Uh, I think I am too. And it's so fun just to be doing these books that are so much fun. And then also just where I am in my career of doing this after doing the other show. And it's just the perfect series to do at this time in my life right now. And it's great. It's going to be a fun experience. I'm so excited for everything that is to come. And even like you said, with the stuff that might not look so great looking back, I have the confidence and I'm resting assured knowing that Rick has apologized for those things, Mm -hmm. that even if they come up, It's fine because he has grown and it just makes me so excited to read future things that are coming out. I follow him on Twitter and he just tweeted out that there's more new books coming out under the Rick Riordan Presents title. And I think that's really cool and it makes me very excited and I'm very excited about everything that is to come. So, Delia, thank you so much for joining for these two episodes. This was absolutely a blast. If people want to find you doing stuff, podcasts, internet, anything else, where can they do so? You can find me on Twitter at Delia is typing. Um, That's D-E-L-I-A is typing. I talk about all manner of nerdy stuff. I said it last episode lately. I've been, I'm always on a Lord of the Rings kick, but it's been strong because I am rereading currently The Two Towers. And as far as my podcast, we have an Instagram at the nerds are typing. You can find all of our links and stuff there. And of course, you can find you guys aren't new to this. You can find Black Girls Create at blackgirlscreate.org and everything else we do there. Fantastic. All good things. Highly recommend. So Delia, thank you so much for joining the listeners. Thank you all for listening. And until the next episode, I'll uh, I'll pursue you when I see you. <laughs> oh, great. Hey, thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Newest Olympian. This podcast was created, hosted, and produced by me, Mike Schubert. I also run the social media and the website. Our editor is Sherry Guo. The music is by Bettina Campamanes and Brandon Grugel. And the art is by Jessica E. Boyd. If you want to learn more about the show, such as what chapters we are covering in future episodes, you can do so at thenewestolympian.com. And if you go to thenewestolympian.com slash Patreon, you can support the show and get access to a whole bunch of bonus content. And speaking of those patrons, I want to thank our producer-level patrons, Lada Bartova, Kelsey Gillespie, The Damn Steam Nuggets, Emma Cooey, Vicky Garcia, Garcia, Ellie Hoskovchova, Veronica Bartova, Natanya Page, Haley Hastings, Robin Garcia, Frida Vikstrom, Megan Moon, Tough Bayfong, Moo Moo Productions, Don't Call Me an Invadora, Olivia Y, Craig McRoberts, Griffin Dork, Taylor Payne, Giselle Salvador, Minka Dreesen, Can't I Seaweed Brain, Matt Barger, Peter Johnson, The Twins, Sabrina Balsiger, Mooney B, Bony Pony, Harlan Christ, Heather McMillan, Casey Canales, Polly Burge, Nikki Harris, Tatiana Schmidt, Sandra Rose, Bridget Lowry, Josh Wilkie, Martin Anvik, Abby Ryan, Josh Clements, Angela MF, and Mary Baumgartner. You can find us on social media at Newest Olympian on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and we also have a sub reddit reddit.com slash r slash the newest olympian if you want to help the show out non-monetarily you can do so by leaving us a rating and review on apple podcasts or telling a friend who you think would like the show about the show whether you shoot them a message or you tell them in person you say hey there's this podcast it's called the newest olympian it's really great it's about percy jackson you know how you've always been looking for that excuse to read the books you should do it alongside this podcast or you could also talk about it on social media all of these things really help us grow and to find a new audience because we're a new baby podcast and we want to grow into a full-size podcast toddler but again 
again, thank you so much for listening to the show. And hopefully we will see you next week as we cover chapter seven of The Lightning Thief. And until then, I'll pursue you later. Later.